Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I'm Meher Sher and these are the headlines. Indian troops have martyred another Kashmiri youth in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. The occupying forces martyred the civilian during a military crackdown in Shopia district. The occupied valley has been under New Delhi's crushing curfew and communications blackout since August 2019. In Afghanistan, two security force members have been killed and six others wounded in multiple blasts in Kabul this morning. Police said all four attacks were targeted at security officials in various parts of the city. No group has claimed responsibility for the attacks so far. Israeli military has bombed parts of Gaza by conducting airstrikes in the blockaded region in the early hours. Locals say the Air Force hit the al Buraji refugee camp in central Gaza and the Deir al-Bala region. The attack damaged a children's hospital, a residential area and a rehabilitation center for the disabled. Protesters across Armenia are demanding Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan to resign for accepting defeat in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. The protesters shut down traffic in the capital Yerevan after the opposition urged Armenians to join the protest. The 44-day clashes in the disputed region ended with a ceasefire in November. The United States COVID-19 death count has exceeded 330,000 while the caseload of the country has reached over 18.7 million. The new strain of coronavirus recently found in the UK has also been detected in France. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported over 2,000 cases and 63 deaths overnight, taking the toll to 9,816. Global number of infections is approaching the 80 million mark while the death count is more than 1.74 million. And in cricket, New Zealand have ended day one of the first test at 222 runs for a loss of three wickets against Pakistan. Kane Williamson is still on the crease at 94 runs, while Ross Taylor departed after scoring 70 for the Kiwis. Shaheen Shah Afridi was the pick of the bowlers for his 3 for 55 for the visitors. Those were the headlines. More news in detail after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. And now for the news in more detail, we start from Afghanistan, where two security force members have been killed and six others wounded in multiple blasts in Kabul this morning. Police said the day started with four explosions in less than three hours in various parts of the city. Police said the first explosion happened in the Chamane Huzuri area with no casualties. The second explosion occurred in the west of Kabul, which targeted a vehicle carrying a senior official from the VIP protection unit. Police said the third attack was a roadside bomb that targeted a police vehicle in which three security force members were wounded. The fourth blast in the Bori area also targeted a police vehicle. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack so far. Moving on, Indian troops have martyred another Kashmiri youth in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. The occupying forces martyred the civilian during a military crackdown in the Shopian district. The Indian troops have martyred over 150 Kashmiri civilians across the UN-recognized Disputed Valley in the year 2020 alone. The occupied valley has been under New Delhi's crushing curfew and communications blackout since August 5, 2019. 
And Indian farmers have rejected Prime Minister Narendra Modi's allegation of a political agenda behind the protests. Farmers said the Premier should stop confusing people and not obfuscate the movement. The Farmers Union official said the government is not ready to back down on the new agriculture laws. The official added farmers are prepared for a long haul. The Farmers Union will hold a meeting today to discuss the government's offer for talks. The farmers have been protesting in Delhi for over a month now, demanding a repeal of laws that they say will favor big corporations. Israeli military has bombed parts of Gaza by conducting airstrikes in the blockaded region in the early hours. Locals say the Air Force hit the Al-Buraji refugee camp in central Gaza and the Deir al-Bala region. The attack damaged a children's hospital, a residential area and a rehabilitation center for the disabled. Meanwhile, confirming the strike, Israeli army said it hit alleged Hamas targets, including a rocket manufacturing site and a military post. However, the Palestinian authorities are yet to issue a statement on the matter. Earlier, Israeli occupation forces attacked peaceful Palestinian protesters and wounded dozens, including a 10-year-old child in the West Bank. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has held a telephonic conversation with Morocco's King Mohammed VI. In a statement, Netanyahu's office said the Prime Minister invited the king to visit Israel. It said the two leaders also discussed moving forward with a U.S. brokered deal to normalize bilateral ties. The statement read the two determined the processes and mechanisms to implement the agreements. The office said Netanyahu thanked the king for hosting an official Israeli delegation earlier this week. Meanwhile, the Moroccan royal court said King welcomed the resumption of, of relations with Israel. In a statement, the court added King also reiterated Morocco's unchanged position regarding the Palestine issue. Morocco became the latest Muslim state to normalize relations with Israel. Moving on, three UN peacekeepers have been killed by unidentified fighters in the Central African Republic ahead of the country's general elections. In a statement, the UN said two peacekeepers have also been wounded in the attacks on its troops. UN said the assaults took place in Dekoa, Central Kimo Prefecture, and in Bakuma, Southern Mubamu Prefecture. Earlier, Bangui rebel coalition called off a unilateral truce and reiterated calls for suspension of the election. UN Chief Chief spokesperson Stefan Dejaric condemned the attack and called on the country's authorities to investigate the assault. Hundreds of UN peacekeepers and military instructors from Russia have been deployed to the African country to deter the violence. The violence during elections has already enforced over 55,000 people to evacuate their homes. And moving on to Ethiopia, the death toll from the attack in the western Benishangul Gumuz region has risen to 222 people. The Red Cross said 207 victims and 15 more from attackers have been buried. The Wednesday's attack occurred in the village of Bekoji in the Metakel zone. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed called it a massacre and deployed federal troops there the next day. The military killed 42 armed men accused of attacking the village. Ethiopia has been grappling with outbreaks of deadly violence since Abiy was appointed in 2018. Meanwhile, Ethiopia's electoral board says the country will hold a parliamentary election on the 5th of June next year. And on to the pandemic, the United States COVID-19 death count has exceeded to 330,000 while the caseload of the country has reached over 18.7 million. Brazil's death toll has hit 190,000 while its confirmed cases have reached over 7.4 million. The global number of infections is approaching the 80 million mark while the death count is more than 1.74 million. More in the following report. The rate of new cases and deaths across the world makes it impossible now to attribute a single cause to the alarming surges. 
Situation remains the grimmest in the U.S., where the dark winter worn by officials has arrived in Southern California. Health officials say so far the spread of virus has barely slowed in the worst hit state. Canada's most populous province, Ontario, is imposing tighter restrictions in an effort to curb rising hospitalizations. While authorities say thousands of more vaccine doses are arriving in Mexico as families spend holiday alone after having lost loved ones to the pandemic. We want all our patients and family members to get ahead, but we want them to not get infected even more. And we want those who are sick to pull ahead and to live, because it's so tragic in this moment how families are missing mothers or fathers or brothers or children, how some families have been completely dismembered, many have very few members left or no family members. The number of people dying with coronavirus in Italy in the second wave has now surpassed the total recorded in the first wave. Parts of Britain remain under the highest tier four restrictions as the country reported 570 deaths overnight. The new strain of the coronavirus recently found in the UK has now also been detected in France. Meanwhile, South Korea has signed deals with AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson's Janssen to import vaccines to cover up 16 million people. The government's continuous efforts and cooperation with manufacturer Jensen led to a contract of additional 2 million doses. As we have announced, AstraZeneca's vaccine will be shipped in the first quarter of 2021, followed by Jensen's in the second quarter and Pfizer's in the third quarter. In Australia, Sydney's northern beaches will revert to pre-Christmas lockdown as the country struggles to find patient zero for a cluster of cases. In the meantime, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has received his first dose of vaccine as part of a national vaccination plan. Whereas in Pakistan, 63 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours. This takes the country's death toll to over 9,816. Health officials reported 2,260 new infections overnight. The health ministry said there are more than 39,000 active COVID-19 cases in the country. The ministry said out of over 469,000 countrywide cases, more than 420,000 people have recovered. It said over 209,000 cases have been detected in the southern province of Sindh, whereas Punjab has reported more than 135,000 cases. In the capital city of Islamabad, nearly 37,000 have been infected so far. We'll be back with more news after a short break. Stay with us. We're back with more news. Protesters across Armenia are demanding Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan to resign for accepting defeat in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. The protesters shut down traffic in the capital, Yerevan, including presidential and parliament residences. They chanted slogans accusing the Prime Minister of being a traitor over the November 10th peace deal with Azerbaijan. The opposition urged Armenians to join the protest. Prime Minister Pashinyan says he is ready to call an early parliamentary election next Next year. The 44-day clashes in the disputed region ended with a ceasefire in November. And in Georgia, Parliament has unanimously adopted a resolution for membership in the European Union and NATO. The resolution pointed out that membership in NATO will remain a zero-option priority in Georgia's foreign policy. It added that transatlantic unity is the most important precondition for strengthening global security. Member of the ruling Democratic Party, Irakli Kobachzadeh, said... Georgia has been cooperating with NATO since the late 1990s. The new Georgian government has continued the policy aimed at joining NATO. Earlier, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg assured the country that it will become a member without any precise time. Moving on to Ukraine, Ukraine has rejected Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's remarks about weapons smuggling from Kiev. In a tweet, Foreign Ministry spokesman Oleg Nikolenko said Ukraine strongly denies yet another insinuation of Lukashenko. 
Nikolenko said the rhetoric of foreign meddling about the weapons fit nicely into Lukashenko's policy of terrorizing Ukrainian people. The spokesman added that Ukraine is not an enemy of Belarus and condemns terrorism in every form. Earlier, Lukashenko said a terror group led by Nikolai Avatukovich has bought tons of weapons through Ukraine. And Russia and Egypt have discussed the implementation of large-scale projects in bilateral trade and economy. In a statement, Russia's foreign ministry said foreign ministers of both countries discussed a wide range of issues over a phone call. The ministry said both sides reaffirmed to work on the Treaty of Comprehensive Partnership and Strategic Cooperation. It added both gave attention to implement the projects to build the Eldaba nuclear power plant and a Russian industrial zone in Egypt. Both countries also discussed the situation in Libya, noting the need to ensure an inclusive national dialogue for the country. The foreign ministers also stressed on the need to consolidate international efforts for restarting direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And Lebanon's top Christian cleric has pressed politicians to form a government to end the ongoing political deadlock. At Christmas Mass, Maronite Patriarch Bachara Boutros al Rai stressed the need to resolve the severe financial crisis. Al Rai said that if, reasons, that if the reasons for not forming government are internal, then the problem is great because it shows a lack of responsibility. He added, but if the reasons are external, it is greater because it exposes loyalties beyond Lebanon. Lebanon Lebanese politicians have been unable to agree on a new administration since the last one quit in August. Saad El Hariri was named premier in October, promising to form a cabinet, but political wrangling has delayed the process. The resulting deadlock has left Leb Lebanon rudderless as it sinks deeper into an economic crisis. Moving on, China says it firmly opposes interference in its internal affairs. This comes after a top Japanese official urged U.S. President-elect Joe Biden to be strong in supporting Taiwan. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said Taiwan's issues are purely China's domestic affairs. Earlier, Japan's Defense Minister Yasuhide Nakayama said Biden needs to take a similar line on Taiwan as outgoing President Donald Trump. Under Trump, Washington has significantly boosted military military sales to Taipei and boosted engagement. Beijing has voiced opposition to increased U.S. support for Taiwan, which it regards as a breakaway province. In recent months, Beijing's fighter jets have conducted waves of forays, including crossing the midline between China and Taiwan. And in the United States, a blast has shaken the city of Nashville in Tennessee early on Christmas morning. Police say a parked motorhome exploded in the downtown area in an attack described as an intentional act. Emergency officials said three people have been hospitalized, but none were critically injured. Metro Nashville Police Department chief said they are investigating a possible human tissue found near the site. He added before explosion, police heard a recorded voice from the vehicle warning that a bomb would detonate in 15 minutes. The explosion destroyed several vehicles and damaged at least 41 businesses while one building partially collapsed. And instead of gold, frankincense, and mirror, the three wise men are bringing Bolivians an even more important gift this Christmas. It is the safety measures to help stop spread the, the spread of coronavirus. More about the COVID Christmas in this report. As every festival faced the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic, Christmas was also celebrated in a new style this year. The three wise men or magi hit the streets of the city of El Alto in Bolivia. They handed out face masks to local residents and reminded people to protect themselves against the spread of the deadly virus. This is to send a message to the people of the city of El Alto that we can't let our guard down. We are being threatened by a second wave. That's why today we have the presence of the three wise men who are visiting us with an important gift. Not a traditional one, but rather today they are giving us face masks so that we can keep up with all the biosecurity measures. Tradition says that three educated, wealthy and influential Nobel men saw a mysterious bright star appear in the sky. They followed it in order to go in search of the long-awaited Messiah as they had been told in their dreams. They traveled all the way from Persia to Bethlehem to pay homage to Jesus and mark his birth with gifts.
And now on to business. The Customs Tariff Commission of China State Council has extended the additional tariff exemption for six U.S. products by another year. In a statement, the commission said it decided to extend the exemption period according to procedures. It said the exemption was expired on December 25, 2020. The products, including white oil, are among the second batch of U.S. goods. They will be excluded from the first round of tariff countermeasures against the United States Section 301 measure. The commission said the extension will last from today till the 25th of December next year. And in cricket, New Zealand have ended day one of the first test at 220 for a loss of three wickets against Pakistan. Earlier visitors won the toss and elected to field on a full green bowling track at Bay Oval, Mount Mananganui. Kane Williamson is still on the crease at 94 runs, while Ross Taylor departed after scoring 70 for the Kiwis. Shaheen Shah Freely was the pick of the bowlers for his 3 for 55 for the visitors. The second match of the two-match series is slated for the 3rd of January at Hagley Oval in Christchurch. Manchester City striker Gabriel Jesus and defender Kyle Walker have tested positive for COVID-19. The players, along with two members of staff, will isolate in accordance with Premier League and government protocol. City will likely be without the duo for Premier League games against Newcastle United on the 26th of December. Jesus's obvious replacement, Sergio Aguero, is being eased back after a knee issue and played 16 minutes on Tuesday. Jesus has scored four times this season but was missing through injury for a month. Manchester City are eight points behind Premier League leaders Liverpool with a game in hand. And in football, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp has played down speculation forward Mohamed Salah is unhappy at the club. Salah told a Spanish newspaper that he was disappointed not to be captain at FC Midtjylland when Trent Alexander-Arnold was made skipper. The 28-year-old Egypt international also refused to rule out a move to Real Madrid or Barcelona. Following the publication of the interview, Salah came off the bench and scored twice in a 7-0 league win at Crystal Palace. Despite all the speculations, Klopp said Salah is quite happy and enjoying his time at Anfield. Mo is in a good mood. Mo is in a good moment. Um, a really good shape. So that's the most important thing for me. And um, training. Okay, today we're no cameras. And well, no, you would have seen him laughing a lot. Um, he enjoyed the session. So that's um, that's good as well. And all the rest is um, for sure nice for all of you to write about. But um, internally, no, no, nothing really. Now it's time to take a look at the latest weather updates from around the world. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.